Hello, everybody. And today we take a little excursion. Uh, and what I would like to do is to give you a short introduction into a climate risk model. Well, um, a kind of a climate risk model, the so-called integrated assessment models. And I would also like to link back to, well, the topic of our lecture, interest rate modeling, because interest rates enter in such models and they also play an important role in such models. Uh, we have some code, so I will uh, also show you the implementation. It's maybe, yeah, a little toy model, a simplified model but it's also um, a famous one and you can um, extend it in various ways. Okay, so what's this integrated assessment model? So this model combines the evolution of say climate related quantities. So geophysical quantities like for example, the temperature level or also the level of carbon in the atmosphere with economic factors, so production and consumption. And the link between the two is the emission. So the economy will create emissions and the emissions will then be in the atmosphere at carbon and influence the geophysical quantities. I would like to give you as an example, the DICE model. So this is a fairly simple model, which combines these economic factors. And I also try to link back a little bit to our topic, mathematical finance. Of course, after that has been started, yeah, so after the DICE model was introduced, there were uh, many improvements. Uh, so there are many uh, such model which, models which are far more complex. So for example, each subtype, yeah, so each geophysical sub-model yeah, had been improved. So let me give you a sketch of the DICE model. So this DICE model was introduced by Nordhaus well, a while ago. So, uh, but uh, he also published revisions, recalibrating parameters, uh, extending the models, for example, to different regions, the regional model, RICE model. And the acronym DICE is Dynamic Integrated Climate and Economy Model. So here you have again, the two worlds that are connected the economy world and the climate world. Uh, the model was also criticized for its simplifications and um, assumptions. Maybe we can also get a little bit of feeling for this point. So I like to give you the main idea uh, of how such a model works and uh, how, how maybe it links also to, to interest rates. So the model connects several geophysical and economical quantities. Yeah. So like I have mentioned, so we have, for example, uh, the temperature or the carbon con concentration as the geophysical quantities. And we have economic quantities, the population, the productivity, the GDP, and they are linked by the um, emissions. Well, then the economic quantities, you can derive from them consumption and uh, capital, which could then define an utility function. So you can define some kind of um, yeah, measure that measures if you have found um, a better setup. And uh, the free parameter in this 
model, so apart from another parameter, is the abatement cost. So our effort to reduce the emissions yeah, and how, how much does it cost to, to reduce the emissions. All these uh, quantities are well defined or connected by comparably simple functional forms so polynomial power laws. Yeah. And then the model tries to find an optimal savings rate. So I do not focus on that and the optimal abatement rate. So what is the optimal path that you should reduce the um, emissions? So we get some emission path. So that's maybe the main idea. Uh, yeah, the model is simple, but maybe it's a very good example for the class of integrated assessment models. And it is also this, the thing that got all the stuff started. And if you look up code on the internet, you find different implementations in different languages, C++, R, MATLAB, whatever. Um, then sometimes the code is not so easy to read. Yeah, so sometimes code is not very well structured or modularized. It's just a collection of these functions. Uh, the functions are just uh, one or two letter variables. So just like in the original paper, yeah, capital is a K, uh, carbon is an M, temperature is a T, yeah, and then you just have these, these, these formulas, sometimes not easy to read. And also <clears throat> the model uses a hard coded uh, time step. So it is stepping in five years. It is simulating 100 uh, time steps, so 500 years. And this time step parameter is often hard coded in the equations. So if you, if you look at such an implementation, you have to be a little bit careful that some parameters which are linked to the time step. So is it per year or is it per five year? And what does it mean for the next period? So sometimes you have to be careful. Uh, what is the interpretation of the parameter? And it's not so, so trivial to change the time step parameters. Some implementation have the time step as a variable, but then it looks as if it only works for the five year period. Another thing where you have to be careful is uh, the units. And that was also something that I tried to teach you in the lecture that uh, looking at uh, units like in physics, yeah, meter per seconds or whatever, um, is also a very nice tool for uh, mathematical finance. Yeah? So what is the unit of an interest rate? What is the unit of a currency exchange rate of a zero copper bond and so on? And of course here it is also very important Important because we really have physical quant geophysical quantities that do carry a unit, yeah, temperature. And uh, for example, in the model, the unit of the carbon in atmosphere and the unit of the emissions is inconsistent and there's a conversion factor. And the same applies to this time step. Yeah? So if you have something that is measured per year and you step in five years, yeah, there is a conversion factor. So you have to be careful a little bit with respect to such conversions and with respect to units. So carbon in atmosphere, for example, is in gigatons carbon and carbon emissions are in gigatons CO2. Uh, and the co conversion factor is uh, approximately 3.6. Yeah, So each carbon atom is linking to uh, some, some oxygen and so CO2 uh, has a, a higher weight. Yeah? So the is a conversion factor. And I must admit that I'm not 100% sure if my code is uh, uh, correct in all these uh, factors. Yeah, So uh, one, one, ha one has to check very carefully, but um, the code that we will use today uh, is uh, enough, is, is good enough for illustrative purposes. So you see the main effects. Yeah, so. Okay, so that was maybe a small disclaimer if you look at this, this model. So let's start with a sketch of this model. Okay, so I will discuss all the functions with you. And I assume I go 
step by step uh, introducing a function that depends on a certain quantity. And then I define the next function that describes this quantity as depending on some other quantity. So we were going a little bit now backwards through the model. And <clears throat> the model assumes a damage function. So we have here our damage function. So this is here the omega. So, and this is a ratio of the cost domestic product. Yeah? So somehow, uh, so what we produce and there is damage created and this damage function here is between zero and one. So it is um, the proportion of the GDP that has to be used to repair this damage, for example. You can think of this like this. Um, so this damage function is just a function of the atmospheric temperature. So we have here a function that depends on the T subscript AT, which is the atmospheric temperature. And the model just assumes a polynomial well, actually only the quadratic term is here. So it assumes that the damage is 0 0.00236 times the square of the atmospheric temperature. Well, to make this function then between zero and one, it is D divided by one plus D. So actually you have phi two, T squared divided by one plus phi two T squared as our damage functions. And that's maybe a good point uh, to already get a feeling yeah, for what the model is assuming. So this temperature is defined as temperature, temperature level above pre-industrial pre-industrial temperature, and it is measured in the units of degrees, well, Kelvin if you like, or Celsius. And a rise of say one degree, yeah, so it's maybe a delta T, yeah, so a rise of one degree compared to pre-industrial, uh, that would give us for the D, well, the D would be just phi two times one squared. It's just the phi two. It's just 0 0.00236. And so the D is the 0 0.2 divided by one plus 0 0.2. Okay, that's approximately 0.2% for the omega. So the omega is approximately 0.2% percent. Okay, so that's just a small, really small damage. Uh, well, if we move to three degrees, yeah, okay, then we get actually nine times the phi two. Okay, and then the omega is a little bit larger, we have a two percent. Also, to me, it looks like as if this is a small damage. And then if you move to 10 degrees, okay, then we have a 100 times the phi two and our omega is now, well, because there is the divided by one plus, yeah, it's a little bit smaller, say so it's 90%, yeah? You can check it as approximately 90%. Okay, so we already have a bigger damage to our economy. Um, and this is a really simple, simple function. Yeah? And maybe you can debate now if this function is accurate enough or if the coefficient that was used here. So this is here the coefficient from the original uh, version, I believe from the 2016 version. Uh, so if this coefficient is uh, appropriate. Okay, so now we have our damage. Uh, in terms of the atmospheric temperature. So next thing is that we define our temperature. And now the model models atmospheric temperature, but also models 
other type of temperatures, there's also the temperature of the land and the temperature of the ocean. So temperature of land and ocean is one um, other quantity. So it's here, this TLO. So actually we have a temperature vector. Then there's an exchange yeah, between these two regimes. Yeah? So the ocean will slowly heat up and then it will also uh, give uh, his energy back to the atmosphere. So there is some kind of a temperature cycle. So we have a temperature cycle that is defined here by this matrix. So now I have a temperature vector and there's a matrix. Okay, it is almost the identity. So, but there is also a little bit on the off diagonal elements that dissipates temperature to the other um, regime. You can look up the matrix in, in our code. But now temperature is changing by another part. So the atmospheric temperature is changing. Okay, this is our greenhouse effect by something that is called the forcing. So there is here our forcing. Oh, actually, I see there's a small typo. Yeah, so that vector here is has just one other element. Okay, um, so there is a plus um, of some additional term, and um, this forcing will increase the temperature level for the next time step. So we have this kind of diffusion. So where temperature is distributed between the two regimes and there is the increase of the temperature. So the model starts now with an initial value of 0.85. So we are already at a higher level of the temperature. So this forcing term that describes how the temperature increases is now a function. So we have another function of the atmospheric carbon concentration. So if we have more CO2, yeah, or this is now the carbon uh, in the atmosphere, we will through the greenhouse effect get a larger temperature. So this model is here with a logarithm. So actually it is logarithm to the base two. So that means this coefficient here in front is the temperature increase. Well, to be precise, it is the forcing because in our other equation, there's also here a coefficient here in front. Um, it is the forcing per doubling of carbon, carbon in atmosphere. There is also another term, the external forcing. So there is here some additional term. Well, because there is also a temperature increase due to other greenhouse gases, yeah, vapor or whatever. And this is just a model using here this carbon concentration. So there is an additional term called external forcing, which is in the code then just either constant or a linear function of time. A very simple <clears throat> additional term. So we now have everything in dependence of the atmospheric carbon concentration. So damage is a function of temperature. Temperature increases by this forcing and forcing is a function of the atmospheric carbon concentration. So now this carbon concentration is like the temperature evolving over time. And it's also now modeled as a vector that is diffusive. Yeah, so we have the atmospheric carbon concentration, our MAT, but we also model two other quantities. So we model the carbon in upper and lower ocean. Yeah, and now these two parts here are separated. So because the ocean is also taking the carbon out of the atmosphere, 
And this is also an interesting thing because uh, one believes that the ability yeah, of uh, taking the carbon out of the atmosphere, yeah, it's uh, getting uh, less and less yeah, because there's some kind of saturation. But here we model this vector and there is some matrix that models the carbon cycle. So how the ocean is extracting carbon from the atmosphere and how it's getting back to the atmosphere. Okay, so there is some kind of matrix. You can also think that it is like a diagonal matrix with a little bit on the off diagonal um, elements that describes how the stuff is evolving across or how a fraction of the stuff is evolving uh, through these uh, regimes. Then important, we have the um, emissions. Yeah, okay, and this is maybe dirty stuff. So let's use now a brown color here. We have the emissions that increase the first component of our vector, which is the carbon in the atmosphere. So in each time step, we add through the emissions more carbon to the first part here of our vector. So the emissions are now the thing that links the geophysical model part. So now we are through the model, through the geophysical parts, yeah? temperature, forcing carbon emissions, that these are linked now to our economy. So idea is if our economy is producing more, you know, has a higher GDP, we have higher emissions. Yeah? So uh, production comes with um, emissions. So the emissions are now a function of our GDP. GDP is the defined by capital, labor, and productivity. So, um, well, you have here a simple model, you know, the more GDP, the more emissions, and there are two constants in front of the GDP. There is the emission density, okay, that will be described on the next slide. And there is um, a parameter one minus mu. So whenever we make mu larger, you know, the emissions become smaller. And this is the fraction of abatement uh, we are uh, uh, doing. So our effort to reduce the emissions. Yeah. So our effort to move to a more sustainable um, economy. So this mu is now the free parameter in our model. So we, we like to increase the mu to reduce the emissions. Before I come to the mu, what is here the parameter sigma? So the sigma models the emission intensity and this emission intensity, well, this, is just a very simple exponential decaying function. And it reflects a little bit our improvement in energy efficiency. Yeah? So we will have, well, better light bulbs. Yeah? So in order to produce the same, yeah, we will have less emissions. So this is a little bit reflecting the improvement in energy efficiency. And I sometimes give all the parameters here on the slides. Yeah? So here you have some um, exponential decay yeah, with this exponential decay rate. And this exponential decay rate is starting here at 1.5% per year. Yeah? So an e to the minus yeah, g times uh, delta t. Um, but, uh, well, we we will not decrease always at the same rate. So maybe in the beginning, it's far easier to improve this than in the end. So this rate here will also then decay. So there is a decay of the decay rate. So the exponential decay will decay. So with the 
one minus d, yeah, so I always multiply with a one minus d, um, d here 0.1% yeah, in every year step. So we will use 1% of the rate, so 0.1% of the rate. So let's have a small break here, yeah, and, and see what we have so far. Yeah. So I defined all the dependencies a little bit backward. So damage depends on temperature. Temperature increases over time by this forcing. The forcing is defined through the carbon in atmosphere. Carbon in atmosphere increases over time as a function of the emissions or if we add emissions and emissions are defined in terms of the GDP. And now the point is that the damage is a damage to the GDP. Yeah? So this guy will damage the GDP. And all uh, in this uh, cycle is now our um, abatement. Yeah? So we try to reduce the emissions. So somewhere here in between, there is this coefficient one minus mu yeah? uh, that we like to reduce the emissions. But of course, the one minus mu uh, is also creating cost. So it will cost something to reduce the emissions. <clears throat> so these are then the abatement cost. So we have that what is left over is our GDP minus the damage minus the abatement cost. And that defines now our objective function. So the stuff that we would like to maximize uh, our welfare. Well, um, not to 100% because we will use part of the net GDP for consumption, yeah, which makes up then maybe happy, which defines our utility function. Uh, and we will use another part. Yeah, there is some savings rate. We will use another part to be reinvested into the economy. And that defines the GDP for the next cycle. Okay, so I will come to this. So this guy here is our more or less objective function. And this here is the input parameter. How much do we reduce the emissions? So what is here our parameter mu? So the abatement cost, the cost to achieve a certain reduction in the emissions is proportional here to a proportional factor to the GDP. And it's also just modeled with um, a simple functional form uh, that is of course here a function of our parameter mu. So there's mu here and the cost to achieve a certain reduction is uh, decaying over time. So it will be uh, cheaper to reduce uh, carbon um, in the future. So that is maybe some uh, technology uh, advantage that is gained over time. But you also see that there is here some uh, power law. So um, it's maybe easy to achieve um, the first uh, reductions, but then it's getting more and more um, expensive. All the parameters that are here on the slides are then calibrated yeah, to uh, observations or expectations. But uh, let me just state the, the, the models with these parameters and you can then just take the parameters from the original paper, but the parameters were then calibrated. So now we have reduced our GDP by the two parts. So there is the damage and the abatement. 
and the remaining part of the GDP. So that is here the one minus omega. So the remaining part after we have repaired our damage and the one minus uh, lambda. So the remaining part after we have then paid for the abatement that can be used for consumption or investment. Okay, so we have here consumption and um, investment. And now the model has a so-called savings rate. So that's here the function S, which defines how much of this amount is reinvested and how much of this amount is consumed. So our objective function, our utility will actually then be here a function of this consumption. But of course, if we consume too much yeah, in the beginning, there's nothing left to invest into the next cycle and the economy will then uh, decline. Yeah? So the savings rate is also a parameter that is optimized in the model. Uh, in our small toy code, I just use um, a constant for the savings rate and you will see that we will see some reasonable results, but the results are maybe not in accordance with uh, what the optimal model is then uh, saying. Okay, but it's uh, enough to, to actually get the main idea and just assume this parameter is a constant and we will focus on this abatement function. So we will focus here on the mu. So how much should we reduce the emissions? So we have the consumption and the investment. The investment is then entering into the GDP for the next time step. So, and how is this going to happen? Yeah. So the investment determines the GDP for the next uh, time period. The consumption defines our welfare. I will come to that. So how is this investment happening? So there is another evolutionary quantity, the capital. So we have the capital K. The capital K just evolves here by this very simple uh, function. And the investment is then added to the capital. And if I have the capital, the population, and the productivity, that defines the GDP for the next period. Okay, so this is just a classic economic yeah, model, a simple one. And um, so then we have the GDP for the next uh, period and the cycle uh, starts again. So that was the part that was reinvested. The part that is not reinvested can be consumed. So that is here our consumption or consumption per capita. Um, and now we define a utility function. So maybe you are happy if you consume something, but of course, you, maybe your happiness is not doubling if you consume uh, twice as much. So we have some uh, function that maybe looks like that here, okay, for the utility. So this is actually just the utility function from the paper. And now we'd like to maximize this function here. Well, you see this function depends on time and we like to maximize, uh, well, the integral of this function. So I will sum all the utilities over time. And when I sum all the utilities or these social welfares over time, then there enters a discounting. So there enters um, a time preference, if I would like to consume earlier or later, or speaking in our terms of interest rates, uh, it's a discount factor with an interest rate. 
So finally, this here is the quantity we like to maximize the total welfare. So the sum of the discounted uh, utilities over time. So that is another simplified picture for the model. Yeah. So now for this um, economic part with the objective function. So our GDP defines the consumption, defines this utility function, and then defines this total welfare, you know, the integral. Okay, so you see that what we are doing is just, as you know it, we take the future values, yeah, and we sum the future values all discounted with some interest rate R. So our observation is that this valuation here includes a discount factor. And with respect to the interest rate, the model is very simple. It just assumes here a single interest rate, a single discount rate. The interest rate does not depend on time. It is um, deterministic. However, this discount factor is quite important for the model. A smaller discount factor means that uh, damages in the distant uh, futures are uh, less harmful, yeah, are considered less harmful. So a larger interest rate means a smaller discount factor. So there is a dependency on this uh, factor. So let's look again at the economic part of the model. So our climate model is now here inside this box. So we have that the GDP will create emissions. Then we have some technology to reduce the emissions or we take some efforts to reduce the emissions. So that defines here my one minus mu. So then this is the emission that enters into the climate model that will create the damage. Of course, to achieve here this one minus mu, we have to take uh, a part of the GDP yeah, to achieve this. Uh, there are abatement costs. So the one minus mu also defines the abatement cost. Abatement cost and damage here and here will reduce the GDP. The remaining part is then split between capital and consumption. From the capital, we can feed our GDP for the next cycle. So actually here we have the step from T to T plus one uh, to the next time step we can then define the GDP for the next time step. And of course, my climate model also evolved, yeah, temperature, carbon cycle, all that evolved to the next time step. So there is a, another cycle here where this model is going to the next time step. And the thing which we would like to optimize is that we would take here this parameter yeah, and make it larger and smaller yeah, to optimize our objective function and our effect, uh, objective function is now this consumption. Well, in terms of the total welfare, yeah, you also you feed it into the utility function and then calculate the total welfare using the discount factor. So the interest rates are then entering here. So interest rates are entering there. Maybe we take a look at an implementation. Okay, so I have 
a small implementation of this here in uh, Java. So there is a class dice model experiment. Okay, so what I'm doing here is, okay, I, I model 100 time step. Also this implementation here assumes the time step size of uh, five uh, years. Yeah, so if you like to move to a different time step size, you should recalibrate, recalculate some of the parameters. Yeah, so there is a little issue. Um, and I will simulate some of the quantities, temperature, carbon concentration, GDP, emission abatement. Yeah, so this is the mu, damage, capital, population, productivity, welfare, and value. So these guys here are just stored because I like to plot them. So this is my little experiment. And I can run this experiment for different abatement functions. So this abatement function here is my mu, my mu of uh, t. So I can now check uh, what happens to these quantities yeah, if I start with a different mu. So that's exactly here the optimization problem we had here on the slide. So that here is the input to my model. And then I just let the model run and I take a look how the quantities evolve over time. Okay, so I'm initializing here um, the abatement function and I take a very simple function. I take a piecewise constant function that is rising linearly. So from an initial value, I have some slope and I'm just increasing linearly. And then if I re reach 100%, so this guy here is 100%, then I will have just a constant. Yeah? So just this is the linear interpolation between the starting level, which is 3% and 100%. And when I reach the 100%, yeah, I stay constant at 100%. So we are net uh, neutral. So there are no more emissions. And the only parameter in my little experiment is here, how fast are we going to this level yeah, of being uh, neutral? So that here is a small loop that I would consider uh, several of such uh, scenarios, and you will see them uh, in the plots. Then I let my model run, and I will create here uh, different plots of the damage, the carbon, the temperature, and the um, abatement function. And I will also print our valuation so this here is the valuation at the last time, but it's actually the sum that accumulates all the stuff. So this is really the total welfare. So I will print a small table uh, with that. So if I let this now run, so you see he's printing this table and you see here different functions for the abatement, for the temperature, for the carbon and the damage. Yeah? And that for different scenarios. We will look at this later, but now let's look at the implementation. Okay, so I'm building the model by first defining some state vectors. So this here is my initial temperature. So the temperature vector, as you saw on the, on the slide, this is my carbon concentration vector. So the initial carbon concentration, the level of carbon. Then I define some components of the model and my components of the models are here in this package. So you see that I use here a default constructor. So there are no arguments. So whenever I use a default constructor, then I use the parameters from the 
original model. So you see here damage from temperature, that is our damage function. So it's the function A0 plus A1T plus A2T squared, yeah, where T is the temperature above pre-industrial. Yeah. And I'm using now the default DICE 2016 parameters. So let's look at the temperature damage function. So temperature maps to damage. So you see it is just our polynomial and then damage is damage divided by one plus damage. Yeah? So that, that's the, actually the D in the paper and that's the omega. Okay, and the parameters for this uh, polynomial are uh, zero, zero, 0, 0.00236. Okay, maybe maybe actually I should write here that the function is that divided by one plus that. Okay, so that's that's the damage function. Okay, so um, yeah, it's just the damage function from the paper which I'm initializing here. Uh, what is the argument to the function? The argument to the function is the temperature. So next thing is then uh, we are stepping more or less in the same way as we went on the slides, the evolution of the temperature. Again, if I have a default constructor here with no arguments, I'm just using the parameters from the original model. Yeah? So I'm using the transition matrix from the original model, which is defined here. So you see on the diagonal, you have almost one, and then you have some kind of diffusions between the um, regimes. So the transfer coefficient uh, between the um, regimes where temperature is um, exchanged. So this transition matrix is then multiplied here with our temperature vector. That gives me the next temperature. But in addition, we have temperature plus forcing. So this function here has now two parameters, current temperature and forcing. And this will be uh, then uh, the input to give us the temperature for the next time step. Okay, so the next thing is the evolution of the carbon concentration. So let's look at that guy. Okay, it's now um, a three vector, the carbon concentration. If you look at the carbon concentration, that's a three vector. Okay, carbon in atmosphere in shallow ocean and lower ocean. Default constructor is just initializing with the values from the original model. So I have again a transition matrix between the three regimes. Yeah, these are just the coefficient from the um, original paper from the original model and the Evolution is then that I have that the next vector of carbon concentrations is this transition matrix multiplied here with the carbon concentration vector. Plus the first components gets an additional amount of carbon, which is my emissions. So, and here the second parameter is then the emissions. The emissions are here in gigatons CO2. So you have to convert it to carbon, gigatons carbon. So there is here some conversion factor. So we have um, the forcing. So there is the forcing function. Forcing is a function of the carbon concentration. So this links now the carbon to the temperature. There's also the 
external force forcing. Um, these are just the parameters from um, the original paper. So this is our uh, forcing per carbon doubling. And then we have the logarithm of carbon concentration in atmosphere divided by uh, the carbon concentration at the base level. And it is a doubling. So I divide here by log two plus the external force. So now there is the emission intensity. So the function that um, tells me how much emission do I get per GDP. So this is the function sigma in the paper. So it was some exponential decay yeah, because we are getting more efficient yeah, with some parameters. And then there is the emission function. So the emission function is the function that tells us how many, how much emission do I have per GDP? So the emission or from the GDP. So there is the um, emission function, which is a function of the economic output. So the GDP, and you see it is here multiplied with the emission intensity function. So then on these emissions, we perform abatement and abatement has some abatement costs. So this is our abatement cost function, also the function from the slide. So this is how the little mu translates to the lambda. How much does it cost to perform this reduction? So this is just the function from the slide, it's the function of the mu, yeah? So this guy here is the mu. Okay, so I have just defined all these functions here. All these functions are just here in separate classes. So you could change the functions. And now we will start with some initial values here for our economy, the initial capital, the initial population, uh, the initial productivity factors. Some of these guys here are scaled. Yeah. Uh, so these are millions. Uh, some of these are scales uh, to billions. And sometimes you see therefore here also a hard coded conversion factor. So I just copied that from the um, original publication. But but there's something which is in a code not so nice. Yeah. I mean, you should be clear, yeah, and maybe I should also improve this code here for the demo for you. Uh, you should be clear on the units and you should be clear on the conversion factors, yeah. So hard coded conversion factors are sometimes um, yeah, a root of uh, errors. So speaking about the economy, here are the three evolutions of our economy. So the evolution of the capital. That is also just here a very simple uh, function plus the investment. Uh, so it is a function of the investment for a given capital and a given investment. This here is the next capital. Um, then we have the evolution of the population. I believe I did not have these guys on the slides, but you can just uh, look them up. Yeah, it will start at some initial population and uh, it has some, some asymptotic population uh, in the uh, growth rate uh, or how, how fast we are approaching this uh, asymptotic uh, value. So the end, the same for the productivity yeah, there's also a very simple model for the productivity with some um, exponential decay rate here. Yeah. So productivity increases at this rate, but the speed of the rate will decrease. Yeah. So a very similar model to the um, emission intensity. So that was it to just specify the model. 
all these guys are just functions that depend on them, some of the other guys. And now let's set the initial values and uh, loop over all times. So what are we doing? Uh, we have a certain carbon concentration and we have a certain uh, temperature. So let's calculate from the carbon uh, concentration, the forcing. Then if we have the forcing and the temperature, we know the next temperature. Then we have the abatement function. Then we can calculate it calculate the emissions. So the emissions are the emissions that we have from the GDP, but we need to multiply with the one minus mu. So this is the one minus mu to get the uh, net emissions that we have. So these emissions, if we have them, they add to the next carbon concentration. So we have here already created the next temperature and the next carbon, and we have calculated the emission from the GDP. Then we have the temperature, we can calculate the damage. We have the abatement, so we can calculate the abatement costs. So if we have the damage and the abatement, with the GDP, we can calculate our net GDP. So we, we, we are here. Yeah? So we have now the damage and the abatement part and our GDP. So we can calculate our net GDP. We can now distribute this net GDP to consumption and investment. And that will define the next capital. And if we have population and productivity, it will define the next GDP. So that was the whole cycle. So we calculate now our utility. Our utility here is this to the power of one minus alpha function. We discount with our discount factor to get the discounted um, utility. So actually that's here. And I store this discounted utility here in this vector value. Actually, the vector value is of not much interest. We are just interested in the last value. The last value is just the sum of all these guys. Um, the utility function due to this divided by one minus alpha is negative. Yeah, so that may be a bit confusing. Yeah, but if you look here, we are using here this function, one divided by one minus alpha x to the one minus alpha, but alpha is larger than uh, one. So actually it's a function that is taking here negative values and then it's increasing. So we are actually in the optimization, we like to maximize this. So if we will, you, if you look then here at the figures and you would like to maximize, then this guy here is better than that guy here. Yeah, uh, maximizing the negative number is yeah, minimizing the um, absolute value. Okay, so the 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 positive part. Um, so that may be a bit confusing. Yeah, you can define the utility. You can. Uh, take a shift or a scale and then look at that function. Okay, and that was our little implementation. Yeah, So um, a small uh, model. Yeah? Uh, let's run now this experiment. So as I mentioned in the experiment, I have here my model and I have here my experiment, I'm running over different uh, abatement scenarios. So I'm now looking at different abatement functions. The first scenario that pops up here is the one where we perform the abatement up to 100%. Um, and we are reaching the point at time index 25. Yeah. So actually, since we are stepping in five years, yeah, that's in 100 and 
25 uh, years. So that's a scenario. Um, well, do not interpret this now as realistic with respect to time, because I have a fixed savings rate and maybe one should check all the parameters again. But for the qualitative picture, it's maybe nice to see what's happening. So if we are going in this scenario here, then temperature is rising up to 5.5 well, or almost six degrees. So the carbon is rising here up to 1,900. And then if we reached here this abatement, carbon is declining. Okay, so we have some kind of an overshoot and then it's declining. So our damage is rising to 7%. Okay, so that's the um, scenario. So now let's do the abatement later. Yeah, So if you move to the scenario where you do the abatement a bit later, the temperature is rising higher, so we are rising here to seven. The carbon, okay, so where's my carbon, is also rising higher, it's rising to 2,400, so that's reasonable. We are not investing too much into the reduction of the emission, so carbon is rising, temperature is rising, and also the damage is rising, Okay, so damage is now rising here up to 10% before it was rising to 7%. Okay, so that was this scenario. Now there is also the scenario if I go to 50. So if you compare the temperature, we are rising to eight degrees, uh, even a bit higher. If you compare the carbon, it's even higher if you compare the damage, okay, we are now going to 40%. And then there's the scenario where you actually wait till the end. Okay, temperature is even higher, carbon higher, damage higher. Or there's the scenario where you just do nothing. Okay, so you just do nothing. Let's have a look at that last guy here, if we do nothing. So if we do nothing, temperature rises to 14 carbon to 11,000 damage to 30%. Okay, so um, the values are maybe not realistic, but the behavior of the model yeah, is uh, like you would um, expect it. And now the question is, what is maybe the best strategy for this abatement? So that's the question that is, um, that is tried to be answered by this model. And we can maybe look at this by looking here at our um, objective function. So I'm plotting here our objective function. So that's here the total welfare, our discounted welfare. And now I could just look where is the uh, maximum of that function, yeah? Okay, so the maximum of that function, it's negative. So here it is still rising. Yeah? So you see that is still rising. Uh, three, five, okay, that's still rising, rising seven. Okay, somewhere here is um, the best uh, value, yeah? So, okay, at time index 80 is maybe the best value. If you just consider these, functions. So now I'm using here in my little experiment. Yes, that okay. Now I'm using here in my little experiment, um, a fixed discount rate. So what happens if you use now, okay, maybe I copy that it's 80 here. Yeah? <clears throat> for this discount rate. So what's happening if I use the discount rate 3%? Okay, what's happening then? So let me run the experiment again. 
Okay, so we get all the nice plots again here for all the scenarios. And this is here our total welfare function. So I now I like to maximize this function. So I'm not using one of our root finders, which I could use. Um, I'm just looking, okay, where do I find the maximum? Okay, so here it's still rising. Okay, yeah, maybe 2016. Okay, so maybe it's here. Yeah, So maybe it's 100 and 53. So you see that increasing the interest rate is decreasing the discount factor. So increasing here our interest rate R is decreasing our discount rate. So it will make damages in the future may be less harmful. So that means my model is now telling me, okay, you have more time, you can abate later. Also abatement later is cheaper. And you see that actually just changing here the interest rate by these 2%, is somehow doubling the time period, almost. So it has a big, big influence on your assessment. And you could, easily, uh, you could even ask if um, a risk neutral interest rate is already suitable for this. Okay, so that was the part on the implementation. And I also already did the part on the numerical experiments. So you find here the link to this code in the script, you can play a little bit with this. And maybe you can also try to extend it, yeah? optimize the emission path, optimize the savings rate. Uh, we will maybe have a small um, assignment on that. Uh, yeah, then let's do some numerical experiments. We did that. Okay, for example, try with different abatement functions, piecewise linear functions and also explore different interest rates for discounting. So we already did that. And let me conclude by uh, making some more remarks here on the role of interest rates in this model and also in um, other such uh, models. So the model is really simple. Huh? So we had the, these remarks uh, already on the slides with respect to the discount rate. So the model just uses here a single constant discount rate. It does not depend on time. And the discount factor has a strong impact on the results. So to get an intuition, if you have a smaller discount factor, then it means that damages in a distance futures are considered less harmful. And also it's cheaper to pay for the abatement in the future. So it really changes your strategy. And in the original paper, you find, for example, this plot. So from uh, these experiments, you can now define a quantity that is called the social cost of carbon. So you can think of it as being your CO2 price. And you see that this CO2 price now depends on the interest rate. Yeah, so if you change here the interest rate, say from one to 3%, you get a much lower CO2 price, which means that maybe you can just uh, wait. Yeah, People will not uh, have such a pressure to reduce um, emissions. Um, and you see that this is really making a huge difference here in this region. And for example, currently we have negative interest rates. Yeah? So what is now the right uh, social cost of carbon? Yeah? So what is now the right uh, emission path? Yeah? You, you see that here we have a lot 
um, of impact. And the reason why we have this impact is because um, interest rates have this thing, if you think of them naively, there is the possibility to perform a reinvestment. Uh, you can earn interest on interest. So you get in the next cycle 10% on your previous 10%. And this, of course, leads to exponential costs. You all know this because we have a lecture on interest rates models and we have defined the interest rates. And you saw that you can just define our interest rate in terms of uh, an exponential, which gives us a zero Cobra bond price. Uh, if you just let the interest involve and you always have 10%, then you get just an exponential growth. Uh, so, of course, the exponential factor here is not the 10%. It's actually uh, the logarithm of 1 plus 10%. Uh, so I have exponential growth. And now the model simulates 500 years. So just if you would look at 100 years, you would see that if you have interest rate 1%, 3%, 5%, then this makes a huge difference. Yeah? If you start with uh, 1%, then the e to the minus rt with a t being 100 years is 36%. So it's one third of the cost of today for the damages and the abatement. But if you move to 3%, then it's already only 5% of the cost. And if you would move to 5% interest rate, then it's 0.7% of the cost. Yeah. So you see, you have um, a huge, um, a huge uh, difference yeah, in what your assessment of the future events is. Okay, so that was maybe my small session on the integrated assessment models. You find the link to the original paper, actually the revised version yeah, uh, of the original model here. And of course, there are also um, other implementations in other languages, which I have here on the slide. That was it. Thank you for today.